Good morning, everyone. Welcome to an all-new edition of Art Speak TV and Radio here on 89.5 FM WSKB, Westfield Community Programming, and our media partners at Agawa Media and Southwick Community Television. I'm your host, Mark Auerbach. Peter Coles is our chief engineer. And today we're going to Hartford to Theater Works, where the recent Broadway hit, Lynn Nottage's Clydes, is making its regional premiere. It opens July 7th, runs through the 30th at Theater Works. And with us right now is the director, Michael Burke. He's a Chicago-based director. Clyde's was a big hit on Broadway as soon as uh, theaters kind of sprung to life after the pandemic. And from my understanding, Michael, it is one of the most produced plays in regional theaters around the country right now. Is this your first stab at it, or did you know the play before you got to Theater Works? Yeah, so it is. It 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 absolutely is one of it is the most produced play of the 2020, uh, 2022, 2023 season as uh, uh, documented by the theater communications group. They do an annual survey. Um, and this is my first time getting to, to dig into this play and, and bring it to life. However, I have, uh, I did, I was fortunate enough to see a production at the Goodman in Chicago um, last fall. Um, so I'm, I'm both familiar with it, but excited to, to get to dive in for the first time myself. Um, in doing it at Theater Works, uh, which is a very small, intimate space, and this show was initially done for Broadway, have you had to alter it at all to fit it into a small theater like uh, Theater Works? No, not really. It's, you know, Lynn Nottage, the playwright, is a real, just absolute genius of writing the human condition and writing things at human scale. And so it the, the the play plays in in an intimate setting really beautifully because it is about these people and their personal struggles and the the relationships that are developing between them. And that's something that we can see just as clearly, if not better, in an intimate setting than we can in a big Broadway house. It's really exciting in that way. Uh, give us a thumbnail sketch about the play. Uh, I know it's comedic, but it's serious. And I know it's set in a restaurant that a person named Clyde owns, but fill me in. Absolutely. So Clyde's takes place in a, in a roadside truck stop sandwich shop in Berks County, Pennsylvania. And it is run by a woman named Clyde. And Clyde is a formerly incarcerated individual. And Clyde only employs formerly <coughs> incarcerated individuals. And we all know that it can be very difficult for people um, who have been uh, imprisoned in their past to to get out of prison, restart their lives, um, and find sure footing in their work. Um, and so this play um, takes a look at both the sort of you know physical struggles of of, of getting you know come, getting out and finding work and finding secure housing and things like that, but also the more internal um, you know mental health struggles of of how do you go from being someone that the world considers the lowest of the low um, and rediscovering your own self-worth all through the process of creating these delicious sandwiches. Um, and so it's kind of like a, you know, it's like a, a, a sitcom in a way because it's a workplace comedy. It's like The Office, but it's sandwiches and we're in this kitchen and it's and it's hot and it's cramped uh, uh, and, and, and tempers run high sometimes. But so does the love and the joy um, and the humanity of them as, as we watch their stories unfold. And um, what are some of the how did you well, let's let's backtrack. How did you get into directing? What intrigued you about theater and what made you decide you wanted to direct? Yeah, um, I, I always start this question by going way back to my childhood. And I was. Um, I did church plays as a kid. The first play I ever did, I was about six years old and I played a tulip. I had a teal tulip costume that my mom sewed for me. Um, and so I was always interested in theater uh, uh, to a degree. Um, but what I what I but I played with Legos a lot as a kid too. I've just always been interested in world building um and and diving into other worlds where the rules are different where people behave differently um i you know i grew up 
uh, we are in a, in a fairly conservative environment. And so I've always been fascinated by like, what are other ways that people live in this world? And those things kind of combined into this interest of telling stories and telling stories about people um, both like me and very different from me and finding our shared humanity uh, in that. Uh, and so I went to school for it twice. I have two very expensive pieces of paper that say I play pretend well, um, <laughs> but you know, that's kind of, that's kind of the roadmap. And now I, I direct all over the country. It's really exciting. And just joining us now is Latonia Phipps who plays Clyde in Clyde's Welcome. Hey, how are you guys? Good uh, morning. Good we, morning. Uh, yeah. Uh, Michael sort of described what Clyde's is about, but you play Clyde who owns this truck stop or restaurant. Tell me a little bit about your perspective on what Clyde's is about. Okay, so um, I, I don't know if you guys know the background, but this, um, I'm honored to play Clyde a second time. And um, coming into this, I was told that, you know, this woman is a devil, she's a villain, you know, she's this uh, kind of hardball uh, woman who just puts the smack down on everyone. And upon reading it and doing this play, I said, no, there's, there's so many other layers to this woman. Yeah, she owns a sandwich shop. Yes, she hires these prisoners. But the one thing that I enjoy about playing her is that there's something so human and so relatable about Clyde. Um, I shared with the, the cast the other day that um, like a nugget for myself is that right before I was born, my mom was incarcerated. And I didn't know the story. It was like the family secret, like they kept it to themselves and it started to come out. And I just got attracted to this role. And I was like, why am I attracted to this role so much? Like, wow, why do I like it so much? And I realized it's because, you know, so often you have these women that, you know, get into these positions where they have these stories and you don't know their background. You don't know what they've been through. And so the world has shaped them and formed them to become what they are. And so what they show up in the world is what they are. And the beautiful thing about my mother is that she did not choose to be bitter. She did not choose to allow the system to shape her. She came out of that. She found my father and, and there was love and that's how she led. But Clyde didn't get that opportunity. You know, she didn't have someone there to kind of, you know, uh, chip away at that and, and show her that hope and that dream. And, and you see that happen in the play where these characters are kind of shown that, but Clyde was never shown that. So the world shaped her and that's what she's giving. That's what she, she's working with what she has, you know what I mean? So, so that's kind of like my journey into it. So let me ask you a question. Since you've done the show before and you're coming back to it a second time, and I would assume most of the other people that are involved, Michael, you can correct me. All right, this is their first stab at, at, at uh, Clyde's. Um, are you changing your focus of the character based on the experiences that you had playing it once before? I feel the first time I did Clyde was for Clyde. The second time I'm doing Clyde is for me. I feel like there's something, every single time I play a character, they teach me something about myself. And I don't think I was as open to hearing what Clyde was trying to give me when I first played her. And this time, what she's teaching me is that sometimes you have to be unapologetic in this world. You know, like we all have layers of ourselves. We all go into environments where people accept us and people don't accept us. And that's okay. You know, and I, because, you know, I'm such, I have this thing about me. I'm super bubbly. You know what I mean? I'm like, oh my God, everybody dig me. I'm such a vibe, you know, but uh, that's not always the case. And I'm not always everybody's cup of tea. You know what I mean? And so that's what I am taking from Clyde. Like, I don't know if I can curse on here. And if I am, bleep me out. But Clyde gives no f She doesn't. She, she goes throughout this world, she realizes what the world has given her, and she knows how to get what she needs out of this world. And that's something that I'm taking from her and I'm learning from her, especially, you know, being a woman, being a woman of color, going into rooms, trying to figure out how do I, you know, how do I move? How do I establish myself? And what I'm learning is that that's no longer needed, that when you are there, you are present and you're coming in with all the jewels of yourself and that's okay. So that's why the second time coming around, I'm taking something out of this for me. That sounds great. Um, well, how did you get into theater in the first place? Oh, that's such a great, great question. I love that question. <laughs> so um, funny story, when I was a kid, I was very, very hyperactive and 
I was a little accident prone. I was falling down everywhere. I was just getting into a lot of things. And my mom, you know, she was in her late 30s. She had already had three kids. And she was just like, I, I don't know what to do with this girl. There wasn't all these therapy things, these physical therapy. There wasn't gentle parenting. And she just like, I'm just going to put you in an acting class. I'm just going to put like, take all that energy and put it somewhere else. And what's so funny about it is that it actually worked. And I found my voice. I started speaking out more. You know, I started channeling that energy into other ways. And then this whole thing came out is that it's something that my mom always wanted to pursue. And it kind of like passed down to me. So that's how it kind of came into fruition and me getting into acting. And after that, it was set. You know, you could keep me quiet. I was like, look, I love this. I love storytelling. I love getting the opportunity to, to just, you know, be in the skin of other people. And you have, a, as an actor, you also had an opportunity to write your own show, a uh, one-person show that you've done. What, yeah. uh, is it a bi uh, autobiographical show? Is it What is that based on? Yeah, so the show is called Fishing in Brooklyn, and I've played 28 characters. And as you can see, I talk about my mom a lot, but <laughs> it is a story. It's her and I story. I, I lost my mom when I was 11 years old, and um, I got this huge awakening when I got out of grad school. And, you know, I was just like, I can create my own work. And so I just sat down and I started writing. I took a week writing class, just a week. And I was like, I can do this. And I started writing and writing and writing and giving birth to all these characters. And it what, what the show was kind of based on, it is my story about me and my mom going to Prospect Park in this like kind of forbidding lake and fishing. And all of the lessons that come out of that kind of fishing journey with her and I and what I didn't get you know, from adolescence to adult, I was getting in that show. So it's kind of like my mom was teaching me things about being a woman and about adolescence and growing up and everything. So that's what Fishing in Brooklyn is about. And how often do you get to do that? I mean, uh, you're, you're doing a show like Clyde's. You've done that a couple of times. You're doing other theater pieces. Is the one person show something you do in between or do you set aside, uh, set aside time to take it on the road and do it? That that would be awesome. <laughs> I would love to do that. But um, I haven't actually touched the show, I want to say, uh, in over like eight years. I, I did it. I toured with it. I'm actually on to other projects right now. Like I'm working on a movie that I'm writing. I have a park podcast called Brunch Time Prayer that is all about pouring into people and, and just encouraging people and motivating them. So I'm kind of on to other projects right now. Fishing in Brooklyn was for that chapter of my life. But now, you know, I'm trying to write movies right now. I'm trying to create my own roles and stuff. So I mean, I, I would think that that's the biggest challenge of all is trying to create your own material um, that not only can you do it, but then maybe somebody else can do it down the road, you mm -hmm. know, it, uh, and stuff like that. Michael, you've worked in regional theaters all over the country. What attracts you to theater versus film or television or something like that? Yeah, I, you know, it's honestly, it's the liveness. It's the being present and the sharing space with one another there is nothing more miraculous to me than being in a room with a with an audience and hearing no one breathing or hearing everyone breathing at the same time that intake of breath that gas that collective consciousness and the fact that you know as many eons as human beings have been on this earth we are still able to experience things in the same way um despite the many differences uh in 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 how we live our lives and who we are and i just think it's beautiful um and 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 that comes into my work i really believe that like if, if in making a piece of theater you know if if film and tv right is is it's meant to it's meant to do all of the work and show you everything you need to see so that you can sit back and enjoy but a piece of theater is meant to leave holes and puzzles and mysteries that allow the audience to lean forward and engage with it because they're participating they are completing the work with their presence and i just find that just endlessly thrilling and rejuvenating as an artist I would bet. And what about for you, Latonia, when you're standing on stage and you're doing Clyde's night after night to different audiences, every audience will react differently. Does your performance change based on how there's an interaction with you and the audience? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I think it definitely changes because, you know, as I said in the beginning, Clyde is kind of like everyone loves the bad guy. 
You know what I mean? Sometimes you don't like them. Sometimes you do like them. So I'm always curious to know, you know, how people are receiving this woman because it's all based on perspective. You know, someone could come and see the show and be like, oh my gosh, she was just a lot. She was too much. And then someone can come and see the show. It's like, I get her. I get it. I understand. And other people is like, I want to be her. That's what I want to, this is what I want to bring into rooms when I walk in. And so I'm always curious to know like what people take away and how they interpret it because Lynn, she's a genius playwright. She really is. She causes us uh, to see the humanity of people and to hold like there's a line in the play that says prison is a great equalizer. And I think that's just so amazing because that wraps up what we all are trying to get to as humans, like how do we have a human experience that's bigger than where we came from, our socioeconomic background, like all this other stuff, like how do we have one experience where I can look at your story and say, wow, I've never been there, but I know what it like, I know what it is to feel, you know, disenfranchised. I know what it is to feel forgotten. I know what it is to feel like someone doesn't have never encouraged you. And that's what I love about theater. And Lynn did an awesome job in bringing all of us into this room to sit down and watch this little story and look at ourselves. Because we all have those moments where we've said things that we probably shouldn't, but we need it. It just needed to be said. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, so it's just a, a great way in theater to kind of bring everybody on the same playing field. Um, this play, uh, Clyde's, is probably, according to, I think it's Theater Communications Group, the most produced play in American theaters this year. Mm -hmm. What in your mind, when you saw it the first time or before you actually went, I, I would assume you read it before you signed on to it the first go round. Uh, what attracted you to it and uh, what do you hope audiences pull from it when they see it? Is this for me or Michael? For you. Oh, Oh, wow. That's such a loaded question. Oh. It is loaded. You can answer all of it or part of it or some of it. Okay. Um, so I, I actually did not see it live. I went to the library in Lincoln Center in uh, New York, and I saw the original production with Uzo in it. And what did I first take from this? I saw, I saw aspects of my mom. I saw aspects of women that I've kind of grown up with. I just saw a powerful ass woman. That's what I saw. I saw a woman who does not take no for an answer. And that's what I took away. And I said, those are the roles that I want to tell. That's what I want to do. And what do I think, like what I want audience to take away from it is that we all are on this journey having a human experience. And it might be wrapped in a different package, but we are all are just trying to get there. And some of us get there and some of us don't. But I think that Clyde's causes people to take a look at their good and their ugly. And we can all look at each other and say, we're all just having that same journey. And that's what I want people to take away from it. Like if you can go home and, and reflect on yourself and reflect on your treatment of people and how you're showing up in the world, or maybe how you're not showing up anymore. Maybe there's aspects of you that have not arised into your bossness. And that's what you need to grab hold of because you've been I don't know, whatever it is, you, your voice have been silent. So there's so many jewels to take away from this show. But ultimately, let's leave just having a human experience. That's what I would say. Okay. We're chatting with Michael Burke, the director, and Latonia Phipps, who stars as Clyde's and Lynn Nottage's play, which is running at Theater Works in Hartford July 7th through the 30th. Uh, tickets are available at twhartford.org. We're going to take a quick break to acknowledge our underwriters, and we'll be back with more Arts Beat. Uh, Peter Coles is our chief engineer. I'm Mark Auerbeck. Don't go away. Support for community radio on WSKB provided by Westfield Electroplating. Employing over 140 skilled platers, painters, and technicians, Westfield Electroplating was founded in 1946 and was the first company in the country to achieve National Aerospace and Defense Contractor Program accreditation, proudly maintaining that status for over a decade. Westfield Electroplating provides over 50 quality finishes to meet your corrosion, cosmetic, or performance needs on the web at www.westfieldplating.com or 413-568-3716. Westfield Electroplating, putting the finishing touches on technology. Hi, it's Bob Plass and I have Wow! It's Tuesday, every Tuesday, 6 to 8. Wow! It's Tuesday. 
Community Radio. 89.5 WSC. I did it! <laughs> Live from Studio 120 at Westfield Technical Academy, this is WCPC Channel 15 at 89.5 FM WSKB Westfield. Welcome back to Art Speed, everyone. I'm Mark Auerbach. Peter Coles is our chief engineer. If you've missed a part of today's program or you want to watch it again or share it with your friends, we'll have it archived for you on YouTube under WSKB Community Radio. We're chatting with Latonia Phipps, an actor who is starring as Clyde in the Lynn Nottage play Clyde's, directed by Michael Burke, who are both here. And this is happening at Theater Works in Hartford, July 7th through 30th. Clyde's is one of the most produced plays around right now, and it's making its regional debut at Theater Works Hartford, where both of you are making your debuts as well, I understand. What, what attracted you to Theater Works in Hartford? I'll go first, unless you're Jean Burke, Michael. No, go, 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 go. You got it, you got it, you got it. <laughs> um, I, I think it, it's two things that attracted me. One, to get the opportunity to play this role again. And two, because I, I've never been out here. I've like Hartford, I just discovered is really live with so many arts and you guys have so much going on out here. So when I when I saw this and I saw this audition, I was like, oh my God, you know, there's something in me that wants to do this again. And of course I saw Michael was attached and I was like, who is this guy? Who is this Michael Burke? And I started just like Google and like looking up and everything. And um, when I looked into the town, into the city and I was like, okay, this, this might be cool. This might be a different way to experience this journey. So I was with it. I, and I love Connecticut, so. Yeah. And uh, I mean, it's a, it's a, I have to say, I'm kind of biased. I think theater works as one of the finer theaters in, in Western New England, partly because it's a small, intimate space. And you walk in there and the people are friendly and you sit down and you could be in the last row and it's like you're on stage. Mm. You know, I've seen so many shows here where you can almost reach out. Uh, I, I There was one show where there was a coffee cup um, a, on a table. I can't remember what show it was. And I wanted to, I was so afraid it was going to fall on the floor. I wanted to just go put it back. And I was, wait a minute, you're in a theater. It's not in your living room, you know, <laughs> kind of thing. Um, I know you guys do have busy schedules. So this is just one stop on the, on the theater journey. What happens to both of you after uh, Clyde uh, finishes its run in Hartford? Yeah, so I, as a director, I don't even get to stay for the full runs. I get to stay through opening night. And then after that, the show belongs to the cast and the stage management team. Um, so I, I skedaddle you know, mid July and um, I go back to, uh, I go back to Chicago to do a production of Pearl Plague's Blues for an Alabama Sky a production of Dave Harris's Tambo and Bones this fall. And then I come back to Connecticut later this fall, uh, early winter to do a world premiere, uh, Harris and David Rivers play called The Salvagers at Yale Rep. Um, so I, you know, got a busy next few months coming up and I'm just, you know, and Clyde's is a really great start to a, a, a a marathon, yeah. And his work has been done at Theater Works. Uh, they did this, That's this Bitter Earth. Mm -hmm. That's how I met Rob, because um, I directed that play in Chicago in 2018. And when Rob was looking at doing it, um, he 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 found, you know, he he just dis he discovered me and we were talking about the possibility and we couldn't make that work schedule wise. Um, but that got us talking. And, you know, now we're here and the rest is history. And what about you, Latonia? Me, what's happening? First of all, I this is the first time that I realized that you're going to be leaving midway, Michael. So I'm I'm like digesting that right now. I'm like, oh my god, you're not going to be with us the whole time. <laughs> but what's what's happening with me? Um, many things. As I said, I, I am working on a, a film that I'm developing right now. Um, I just found out this morning that I'm in a mix for the mountaintop. So I'm waiting to hear what that's going to be and just auditioning uh, and, and enjoying enjoying this artistic journey I'm on. Um, I have a couple of things in the bag that's happening for me in regards to some auditions that I went out on. So I'm just waiting to hear that. I don't wanna speak on it because I'm just gonna put it in God's hands and, and let God do what he does. 
But um, I have my podcast, Brunch Time Prayer, on Clubhouse that I am doing, and I will be launching that into a conference. It's a motivational uh, platform to motivate artists and and people who are with faith or non faith, um, just to kind of stay in a great headspace in the season. So that's that's where I am right so now. So in terms of your podcast, if somebody were listening to this today and wanted to catch your podcast, where do they find it? So you can actually go on Clubhouse. You download this little app called Clubhouse. It's, it's free. And you just look for Brunch Time Prayer. And we actually go on every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 1230. And there's also replay. So you'll listen to me kind of giving inspiration words and also my team. You'll listen to people sharing things that has happened to them. So it's, it's definitely a platform for people to kind of come in and get recharged for the week, for the season, for the year, you know. So, yeah. That's great. And, Michael, how can people follow what you're doing? Way. Absolutely. Um, I'm I'm on the socials. Okay. And um, so, for you guys, Theater Works is just one stop on a bigger, bigger journey. I think we're frozen here. We seem to be having some form of technical difficulty. So we're going to go to a break. And I want to thank Latonia Phipps and Michael Burke from Theater Works for joining us uh, this first half hour on Arts Beat. They're both involved in Clyde's. Michael Burke is the director. Latonia Phipps is the star of Clyde's by Lynn Nottage. It runs July 7th through the 30th at Theater Works in Hartford. For details on the production, twhartford.org. We're going to take another break to acknowledge our underwriters and get us back on track, and we'll continue on with more Art Speech, so don't go away. Support for the community programming of WSKB is provided by the Dunkin' Donut Shops of Westfield and the Sardinia family. It's nice to know that even as the world changes, Dunkin' Coffee remains the same at seven convenient locations throughout Westfield. Underwriting support for the community programming of WSKB is provided by the Greater Westfield Chamber of Commerce, the voice of business for the Greater Westfield communities. Informing, educating, advocating, the Chamber provides opportunities for members to make meaningful connections on local, regional, and state levels. For more information on the Chamber's many events, workshops, and programs, as well as the benefits of membership, visit westfieldbiz.org. The Chamber focuses on the most important economy, yours. Hi, it's Bob Plass, and I have Wow! It's Tuesday, every Tuesday, 6 to 8. Wow! It's Tuesday. Community Radio. 89.5 WSA. I did it! <laughs> Live from Studio 120 at Westfield Technical Academy, this is WCPC Channel 15 at 89.5 FM, WSKB Westfield. Welcome back to Art Speed, everyone. I'm your host, Mark Auerbach. Peter Coles is our chief engineer. Sorry for the technical difficulty earlier in the program. Uh, our next guest is Ed Check from City Space in East Hampton, Massachusetts. It is a building that has become a, a cultural center and an art center that is revealed vitalizing downtown East Hampton and putting it on the map in many ways as a cultural presence, Uh, um, a a magnet that was in Northampton years ago and now has sort of shifted the arts uh, community in our area to East Hampton. Ed, it's nice to meet you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So tell me a little bit about how this whole project came to be and what it has done for the people of East Hampton thus far. Well, it's actually started in 2006. I'm, I'm one of the co-founders of, of City Space, which is a nonprofit, 501c3. And uh, I was chatting with Will Bundy, who owns the Eastworks building, um, <coughs> And at that time, the city offices were all located in the old town hall, but they had purchased a newer building on 50 Payson Avenue, and the old town hall was empty, and they were soliciting, um, um, asking for ideas of what to do with the building now. And Will Bundy and I, uh, we, we sort of 
submitted this proposal to bring all of the arts organizations that were kind of scattered all over East Hampton and try to start bringing them all under one roof. So we had this cultural hub that was right in the middle of town. It was a perfect location. And Mike Tausnick, who was the mayor at that time, um, accepted our proposal. And that, that was the beginning of it. So it started in 2006, and here we are, however many years later. <laughs> but um, technically, it's the old town hall, mm-hmm. and what you've developed several performing spaces within it um, yes. that seem to be flexible. A lot of people in our listening area have probably never been there, so can you describe a little bit about what it is? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a beautiful historic building that was built in 1869. Um, you, the very first floor, we have tenants, um, big red frame, uh, Jean-Pierre um, has his frame shop and also uh, his gallery space there. And East Hampton City Arts has their office there. And then also on the first floor, we have a performance space. It's a smaller performance space called the Blue Room that just opened um, last year. And that's kind of a cabaret style space that anyone can rent if you were to go to easthampton.org, you would find all the information about it and how you could rent the space and what its rates are. Uh, Upstairs, on the second floor is, a, is this incredible grand assembly room um, with huge stained glass windows. It's really, really quite something. But it hasn't been open to the public for several years. I mean, like over 25 years <laughs> because it isn't um, up to code with um, fire standards and um, handicap codes. So um, this is one of our missions is to open up that space. So we have now a larger space that would hold about 350. The downstairs space only holds like 70 or 80. And we've been in this major capital, you know, fundraising campaign to to open up the second floor. And those those are the two predominant spaces that are in that building. And who will the when when that second floor opens, who are the arts organizations in East Hampton that will be uh, either in residence or who will this center serve? Well, this, it, it isn't only for East Hampton. I mean, even with the Blue Room downstairs, we have, you know, people coming from Western Massachusetts. They're not only people from East Hampton. It's artists. It's performing artists. It's fine artists who, and we have this whole um, uh residency where where we are providing space for artists to develop their work and actually it's called pay it forward and so again it's not you know there are there are community theater in east hampton there are certain dance organizations and certainly a lot of music but but people are coming from all over because they're looking for spaces to rent and that are and they're looking for spaces Spaces to rent that are affordable. I, think that's I was going to say, um, <laughs> I, I understand that, for example, 20 years ago, all yeah. the artists wanted to be in Northampton, but yeah. it's gotten too expensive for a lot of artists to, to live and work. East Hampton became a great alternative, and Holyoke is becoming an alternative to it. Yep. So you're really providing a service to artists up and down the valley. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I think we've all learned um, that we shouldn't work in our separate towns and cities, that in fact, we all need to talk to each other. And through that collaboration, working with Northampton and Shelburne Falls and Holyoke, that, that, that that's, that's the power of bringing people into our community and our county. And, and I think that's part of our mission. Yeah, I mean, we're located in Westfield, or, or, right. or, and there is a lot of community arts here. There's a great co- little community theater. There's several concert series. Uh, the musicians of the Springfield Symphony perform at the Athenaeum, and it it has a nice uh, spin-off effect because there are restaurants downtown, and it's a un- we're a university town, and it yep. it all adds to it. And I don't know how many people come to Westfield, for example, from Long Meadow or East mm. Long Meadow for their culture, but it's available. I do know that 
there's a buzz about East Hampton. Maybe it's the restaurants, maybe it's East Works um, that has brought that buzz. Maybe it's city space, but uh, people seem to know that if you want to go where it's happening or about to happen, East Hampton is becoming the place to go. Yeah, and, and you know, and I have to compliment this, you know, the mayor um, and the city offices, the fact that we have an arts coordinator that is on the payroll in, you know, the city offices speaks for how they know that the arts are bringing a certain economy into the city. And, and so they're very supportive that we just had cultural chaos, you know, last weekend in East Hampton and where, where they closed down cottage street and all the vendors are there and artists. And that that's an example of the city really actively working with us to help bring people into you know, East Hampton. Um, I th yeah, I think there is a buzz in East Hampton, especially because we have a lot of these old mills and artists are always looking for studio space <laughs> that are affordable. And that's one thing East Hampton has is a lot of old mills. And it's remarkable, even the time I've lived here, when I first moved here, they were all abandoned and now they're all being, um, you know, remodeled and pe people are moving into them. It's, it's amazing. Does the city appreciate the fact that every time you have an event or an art, an exhibition or something mm -hmm. like that, or you're bringing people together, that it has an economic spinoff on East Hampton in general? Absolutely. Absolutely. The city has been incredibly supportive. The city owns, um, this building is owned by the city. And we, you know, they're, we basically are managing this building for them. Um, they, we have a 44 year lease and, and it's an, it's a odd number, but it turns out with a lot of these brands that we go after, they want to know that you have, um, a long range lease in the space that you're in before you can even apply for them. And a lot of what we're doing is applying for these grants all over the place. <laughs> yeah. How many people are involved in, in, in the actual operation of the building, uh, you know, with your whole team? Well, it's a complete all volunteer board. There are eleven of us on um, the board, the City Space Board. Um, Burns Maxi, who I believe you know, and I and know, yes, put put her, uh, put you in touch with me. Burns is the president of the board. She is a remarkable leader. <laughs> she really has changed. She she put City Space on the map. Her, her her leadership, I think she started in 2016, maybe, or 18. Um, she is so dedicated to this mission of, you know, providing a space for artists. And whether that's fine artists or performing artists and, uh, and, and celebrating that. And she's just been a, a remarkable, remarkable person. And, and has, I want to say... Um, as far as bringing in money, she's just been incredible at finding these grants that we are um, capable of, you know, that we can apply for and have, have received them. Because all of this costs lots of money. I mean, one of the things that we're working on right now is that the building doesn't have an elevator, for example. Mm. And that's why the second floor can't be used. So we actually have to add an elevator to the outside of the building, which will stop at five different floors. So the cost of this is in the millions, and we're doing well. We're almost there, um, but 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 we all, we will break ground for that um, this this year. How many people live in East Hampton, and do you have any idea what percentage of them are part of the creative economy? Ooh, I mean, I I mean, the population is over six thousand. I mean, sixteen thousand. It's a good question. I can't say I really know. I don't know what that figure would be of what the the percentage is that's creative um i, I uh, burns would probably know that but I she don't. might she might if 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 i were coming to east hampton and i'd never yeah. been there before and and i wanted to get a a view of kind of like an introduction to the arts in yeah. east hampton where are the places you would tell me to go well, the first thing I would recommend is going to Art Walk, which is the um, the first Thursday of every month. And what what East Hampton City Arts does it 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 gives you a little map of what galleries to go to, or arts any kind of art space within the city, 
And it spread out between, you know, Old Town Hall, Cottage Street, where the mills are over by the Eastworks and um, Keystone Building and all of those. And so that's a great way of discovering all of these spaces. And, 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 and so I highly recommend Art Walk as, you know, a, a, an introduction to everything that's going on in East Hampton. If if you get the funding and you can put that uh, finish the second floor of the town hall, what kind of programming do you guys envision putting in there? Well, again, it's a rental space, so it's not we're we're not we're not taking the role of artistic director, for example. I mean, if somebody wants to rent the space, they can rent the space, and and we have different rates. So one night might be chamber music another night might be a film that somebody wants to show it and another night might be a theater performance um they're, they're usually not one night but 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 it, it it's more it's similar to how the academy of music works because the academy of music is, is a rental space but the academy of music is, is a lot larger <laughs> yeah and, no. a lot, and a lot more expensive too yeah but it's also more of a traditional theater um when you, uh, yeah. I, I i put shows into the academy of music where you have uh, you know full stage area light sound yeah. box office ushers yes. and the whole yeah. whole thing yeah. whereas you guys will have to build that sort of from scratch yeah i mean the, the, it once the second floor is done it, it's kind of the same principle of like a black box theater that you have this room and you you decide where you want the audience you decide where you want the stage and and it, it's taking that kind of approach there there isn't like a proscenium stage in there that 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 it's a fixed stage like the academy of music yeah. this this performance space will be designed in a way that it'll suit whatever the needs are of of whomever is renting it uh, let me ask you a question. If somebody's listening today that's a business person or an individual mm -hmm. that wants to sponsor or get involved with what you're doing, how can they learn more? Do you have a website? Ab absolutely. Um, I can I can actually share it with you very quickly if you want me to. Oh, do please do. Okay. Let me see that I can do this. Well, remember, we're on radio, so why don't you just tell us uh, what the website is? That's probably the best way to do it. Okay. It is cityspaceeasthampton.org, and it's a terrific um, website. It has what are the upcoming events that are happening in the Blue Room downstairs. It has uh, an area of book your event. It tells you how you can book an event in City Space. There's another um, area where it says join City Space, be part of a sustaining old town hall as an affordable and accessible center for the arts and get some great perks, including discounted space rentals and more, become a member today. And you can, you can uh, click on that. You can read about the history of the building. And um, yeah, there's all kinds of fun information there. So, so but, but I would assume that you need sponsors and donors as well in order to, to bring this to fruition. If you're going to spend oh, absolutely. a couple absolutely. of million dollars on an elevator, yeah, to bring people up to the second floor and all yeah. of that. Yeah, no, it's over eight million that we're raising, and, and we're 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 you know we're around six. So, um, but yes, you have to go over. You know, again, uh, a lot of business supports. East Hampton Savings Banks have, has been incredible with their donations, and other banks. And um, again, just, you're always just looking for what kind of funding is out there and what kind of grants are out there. And hopefully the people of East Hampton will appreciate what you're doing and indiv oh, yeah. individuals can write a check, whether it's $10 or $1,000. Uh, you know, Absolutely. To, to help the cause, so to speak. Absolutely, yeah. And 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 um, I want to say the community has been incredibly supportive. You know, everybody's really excited about that. They, they, we, everybody wants this room to open because they know it's been sitting empty for so long. And, and again, it's just an incredible space. They do. Ed, thanks for being here today. Um, well, thank, thank sorry, you. Sorry, sorry for the technical delay earlier on. Uh, we've been chatting with Ed Chuck from City Space in East Hampton. And this wraps up another edition of Arts Beat. We're going to leave you with a snippet with Jordan Donica from the Tony Award nominated revival of Camelot at Lincoln Center. Peter Coles is our chief engineer. I'm Mark Auerbach, and we'll see you next week with another edition of Arts Beat. 
If ever I would leave you, it wouldn't be in summer. Seeing you in summer, I never would go. Your hair streaked with sunlight, your lips red as flame, your face with a luster that puts gold to shame. But if I'd ever leave you, it couldn't be in autumn. How I'd leave in autumn, I never would know. I've seen how you sparkle when fall nips the air. I know you in autumn, and I must be there. Could I leave you running merrily through the snow? Or on a wintry evening when you catch the fire's glow? If ever I would leave you, how could it be in springtime? Knowing how in spring I'm bewitched by you so Oh no, not in springtime Summer, winter, or fall No, never could I leave you At all